Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final discussion of oscillatory motion. Um, we've been looking over the last few weeks here at a number of simple harmonic oscillators. We had a mass on a spring. We had a torsion pendulum. Then we had the simple pendulum, which we've most recently been looking at, which acted like a simple harmonic oscillator, but only for small angles. And now we're going to look at our last kind of simple harmonic oscillator, perhaps, right? something called a physical pendulum. So you see here this uh, bowling pin, which has somehow been attached up here and is allowed to oscillate back and forth, right, like a pendulum. What makes it a physical pendulum, as opposed to a simple pendulum, is that the mass is distributed throughout. It's not concentrated at a single point in the pendulum bob, right, like it was for a simple pendulum. So this is going to make that a little more difficult to deal with, but we'll show you that as we work, okay? So let's examine this. We're going to do a theoretical derivation for the period of a physical pendulum. And like the other derivations we've done, you're supposed to be able to repeat this on a test. So let's consider this about when it's over here, okay? We need to know where the center of mass is. Let's, um, oh, so here's just a vertical line drawn down from the axis of rotation. There's our center of mass. I figure it's somewhere down near the bottom of the pin. You know, I don't care if you put it here or up here, just wherever it is, right? It's down below the top. If we draw a line from the axis of rotation to the center of mass, that's a distance we've done before, right? Center of mass to the actual axis of rotation. In the rotation unit, we would always call that little h. And we're going to call that little h here too. And then theta is the uh, angular position of the physical pendulum, where zero angular position would be at the equilibrium position, which is when it would be straight up and down. Right? That's when the net torque would be zero in this case. And yeah, this is a rotational or angular uh, oscillator, not a linear oscillator. So this is theta, right? So again, note this H, and it's the same H we used in rotation. If you're thinking, huh, we saw that be used a lot in the uh, uh, parallel axis theorem, Mm-hmm. Yep. That's going to pop up in this kind of case, too, uh, as we go throughout this PowerPoint. So, right, H, again, is the distance from the axis of rotation to the center of mass, as it's been in the past. So what forces act? Well, there's a force of gravity, right, acting down from the center of gravity, which is probably the same point as the center of mass, as long as this isn't in some weird changing gravitational field. Right? Um, there technically is a normal force up here, right, where it's connected, but that's going to uh, not provide a torque anyway, right, because it'll be radial, right, it has to act through the uh, pivot point up here, right, so really it's the force of gravity, and much as we did with the simple pendulum, we could break this force of gravity up into convenient purple perpendicular components, one of which would be radial, right, along the radius here, and the reason we would choose that is because that applies no torque, right? And then tangential. Note from the, from the geometry of the situation that that becomes the angle theta, right? Just like this angle up here. And of course, the tangential component of the force of gravity will provide a torque, which is going to be important when we're trying to calculate a torque for Newton's second law in just a couple minutes here, right? So only f of gt. And of course, you can imagine this thing swinging back and forth, and as theta changes, right, the amount of gravity that is f of gr versus f of gt changes. Right? The bigger theta gets, the smaller f of gr gets, right, the bigger f of gt gets, means more torque, because right? it's always the same distance away from the axis of rotation, h away. Right? So just kind of keep those things in mind here as we work through this. So, let's talk about torque, right? Torque is, of course, R cross F, or R F sine theta, and the F in this case is the force of gravity, right? And R in this case is the distance from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force, which is the center of gravity, which is the center of mass, which means that distance is H, right? So here's a little H in here. Now, why did I make this negative? Because you'll notice here, when the angular position is out here to the left, the torque acts back towards the equilibrium position. And if you flip it around, when the angular position would be off to the right, 
the torque would act back towards the equilibrium position. It is a restoring torque. So the torque is opposite right, the angular position. F of G is, of course, better known as MG. So we get negative MGH sine theta. Right? Notice here, F of G sine theta is really just F of GT. Right? So you could kind of write this step as negative H F of GT and then come down to this step. Right? Because F of GT is the hypotenuse sine of the angle. But then we have a problem. And our problem is that if something, for something to be a simple harmonic oscillator, we stated from the very first day of this unit that simple harmonic oscillators have forces, or for angular ones, torques, which are proportional to the opposite of the angular position. And while this one is opposite, it's not proportional to the angular position, it's proportional to the sine of the angular position. So, just like the simple pendulum, we're going to have to use a small angle approximation. Okay. Remember, that means that for small theta in radians, the sine of theta is essentially theta. So as long as we keep this to small angles, right, we shouldn't have too much error, and it should approximate having an equation for the torque of negative mgh theta, for small theta, and therefore act like a simple harmonic oscillator because the torque is proportional to the opposite of the angular position. And so again, like we get F equals negative Kx or torque equals negative kappa alpha, right? We get this kind of situation for torque as long as we keep these small angles. The bigger the angle, the more error you're going to get between real life measurement of period and the theoretical one that we are putting together here. So as this is an angular simple harmonic oscillator, we would analyze it by using the rotational version of Newton's second law. Net torque is I alpha. But as we just showed, right, the only torque is given by the force of gravity. And we know that that torque is negative mgh theta. So we can substitute that in right there. Well, if this is a simple harmonic oscillator, and it certainly has the torque to be so, then we know that the angular acceleration, alpha, is given by negative omega squared theta. And remember, this isn't just any theta in these equations. This is the simple harmonic motion theta, which is theta sub m cosine of omega t plus phi. Right? As it oscillates back and forth, this is what theta does as a function of time. Okay, so realize that uh, that's where we get this equation from. Take two derivatives. Right, of this, and you get this, theta being theta m cosine of omega t plus phi. Now we plug that in, and what do you notice happens? A couple of things, the negatives cancel, but also the thetas cancel. And remember, because this is a loaded theta, this tells us that the angular, uh, sorry, the, uh, the amplitude cancels out, right? Because if you cancel out theta, you've canceled out theta sub m. And therefore, just like all of our other simple harmonic oscillators, a physical pendulum, the period of a physical pendulum, does not depend on amplitude. If it has a bigger amplitude, it means it's got further to go. But if it has a bigger amplitude, there's more torque, and more torque would give rise to a greater angular acceleration. And the math shows us that it's just going to be a big enough angular acceleration to make these things cancel out. And so the uh, amplitude at this point is out as a factor for the period of a physical pendulum. Also, the time cancels out right, as a factor. So we get one period. It doesn't really matter where it is in its, in its oscillation, right? One period from there will be the same quantity. Also notice, I suppose technically, the uh, phase angle or the phase constant cancels out, which means it really doesn't matter where it starts from as long as you do one full motion. Right, you'll get the same period. Solving here for omega, we then get the angular frequency of a physical pendulum, which is the square root of mgh over i. Now you'll notice that unlike when we did this with the simple pendulum, the rotational inertia is going to depend on whatever object makes up the physical pendulum. Right, So I'm going to leave this as i for now. Uh, it'll be something that you'll have to tease out of the actual problem. But I didn't want to know the angular frequency of the physical pendulum. 
Right? I wanted to know the period. But hopefully you remember that angular frequency is equal to 2 pi over the period. 2 pi radians, right? Period is the time for one complete motion. 2 pi radians is the angular displacement for one complete motion. Right? So this is the angular frequency. Remember that it also equals 2 pi times the linear frequency, 2 pi times f, right? Plugging that in, we get 2 pi over the period equals the square root of mgh over i. Solve for the period, and here's our equation for the period of a physical pendulum. Note again how it matches the form of the other three. It's got the 2 pi square root of stuff, okay? But I do want you to be a little careful about something here, and that is this i, Right? Let's look at a couple of situations because it's going to tell us something about what variables are actually uh, affect what variables actually affect the period. Okay, so let's assume that it's actually a simple pendulum, right, of mass m and length l. A simple pendulum is just a physical pendulum where all the mass is a distance l away from the axis of rotation. Right, so if we use the physical pendulum equation and convert. Right? The rotational inertia of a point mass is just ml squared. It's mr squared, right? But r would be l in this case, the length of the string. Plug that in. Right? Oh, and by the way, h, which is the distance from the axis of rotation to the mass, right, is also l in this case. So we plug that in. And we get 2 pi square root of ml squared over mgl. And notice the masses cancel. Now, this is important for you to pick up. Any rotational inertia always has a mass part to it. You know, it might be some fraction mr squared kind of thing for most of our objects. And therefore, the mass is not actually a factor in the period, much as it wasn't for a simple pendulum. Okay, so the mass of your physical pendulum is not going to factor in. Even though it looks like it does because it's part of this equation, it always cancels out when you plug something in for the rotational inertia. And then one of the L's cancels, and so you're left with the very equation we derived yesterday. So notice, a simple pendulum is really just a physical pendulum where all the mass is a distance L from the axis of rotation. In fact, if I kind of, you know, I went from simple to hard here. Some, uh, I know some physics books will do physical pendulums and then tease out a simple pendulum, much as I just did here, right, rather than derive it uh, on its own. But in the AP, you're supposed to be able to derive both kind of pendula from basic principles. So let's take a look at one more situation. What if we had one of our friendly disks that we've used before? But notice we're not rotating it around the axis of, or sorry, the uh, center of mass, because then it wouldn't oscillate. We're going along the outer edge, right? We have the ability to screw this in right at the edge of it. Well, what does our equation predict for the period? Well, let's analyze. The period of a physical pendulum is 2 pi square root of i over mgh. Okay, if this is our pendulum, I just put it at the equilibrium position just so that, you know, we could draw things on it. Of course, that distance is h, right? That's the distance from the axis of rotation to the center of mass. But note, that is the radius, right, of our disk. If we picked some other point, right, h would just be some fraction of the radius. You know, maybe you put it halfway between, and then h would be half of r. But you should always be able to relate it to some fraction of r. So, we want to know the rotational inertia to plug into the equation, but we don't know the rotational inertia of a disk rotated about an edge. We do, however, know the rotational inertia of a disk rotated about the center of mass, and we have a handy-dandy equation that will allow us to convert from the rotational inertia around the center of mass to the rotational inertia around any parallel axis. And indeed, that is the parallel axis theorem. So what is the rotational inertia about the center of mass for a disk? Hopefully you know, because you're supposed to know without looking. It's 1 half mr squared. And as we discussed earlier, the h here, the distance from the axis of rotation to the point, uh, sorry, to the uh, center of mass is r. So we plug in an r for h here. 
Notice both of these are total masses. So we have 1 half mR squared plus mR squared. So the rotational inertia is 3 halves mR squared. Plug it in. Again, note H is R in this case. And so you got to substitute in an R here and a 3 halves mR squared. And just like with the simple pendulum, note that the mass cancels. It will always cancel. The period of a physical pendulum does not actually depend on the mass. It depends on the rotational inertia, but it really depends more on how that mass is organized, not on how much mass there is. Right, so any disk of any mass rotated about an edge would have the same period, which is kind of interesting. One of the R's cancels. And so we're left with um, a period for this disk rotated about an edge of 2 pi square root of 3R over 2G. And this little proof is how you could do this. I've seen them ask about different things rotated. Um, you know, thin rods rotated about some point in the rod other than the center, ma center of mass. Discs, spheres. Um, you know, anything basically that they can hook up at some point other than the center of mass and let it swing back and forth. Sometimes they're combo objects, right? Maybe it's a hoop with a rod through the middle, right, that you can kind of break up. So different things like that that you can create. You just have to be careful about finding the rotational inertia. But we had a lot of practice with that in the rotation unit. Now, once we have this equation, of course, um, if I was going to do this in class, which in class I will, just to show you that everything works, right? The disk we're going to use in class um, has a radius of 0 0.0475 meters. It's a nine and a half centimeter diameter. And it has a mass, oh, sorry, mass doesn't matter in this one, right? And G, of course, if we're doing this in the room, is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So you plug those numbers in, we get a period of a little over a half a second. Right? And in class, I'm going to actually set this up and use the rotary motion sensor so that we can make an angular position versus time graph. And we'll measure 10 periods on there and divide by 10, and we will get a number very close to this. Right? So that I can kind of show you with a little uh, confirmation lab that the equation works. Right? So this is really the end of the oscillations unit. We've looked at four simple harmonic oscillators, although be careful the last two, the simple pendulum and the physical pendulum, uh, only are simple harmonic oscillators as long as the angle is small. Right? And that's something that you, you, know, you may want to remember. You need to remember. It might show up on a free response problem. You know, one of those things at the end, you know, and they might ask, well, or they, you might do the lab and you might get some error from the actual measurement, right? And then they might ask you, why did you get error? And one of the reasons might be, well, you used a, you know, 35 degree angle and that's not small enough and so right you get some error in there so those kinds of things will pop up right so uh there's a worksheet of course to do with this with physical pendulums with different objects it's just a short one pager to practice but again remember you are supposed to be able to derive all four periods of our four simple harmonic oscillators so enjoy when it comes time to take this test, we now only have one more unit to do before we are finished with APC mechanics.